Hello, my name is Cheryl Meyer, otherwise known as Cheryl M. Health Muse, and I am a health coach. I want to welcome you to my podcast, It Feels Good to Feel Good, Future Proof Your Health. This is a weekly show that will share lifestyle changes that you can make to support your health yourself. Why do I want to share this information with you? Seven years ago, After being a business owner for 20 years, I woke up one morning in horrific pain where every bone and every joint in my body hurt. I went to the doctor, she ran lots of tests, and then she ran some more, and then she ran some more, and finally she called me and announced she was gonna give me steroids, but there was absolutely nothing wrong with me and I should seek therapy. I knew something was wrong, I hurt. So she told me I would be on steroids for the rest of my life, and I refused that I was gonna have a life of pain and pills. So why was I gonna take steroids if there was nothing wrong with me? So I dug in and started researching, and I turned my business over to my staff. I found a functional doctor who confirmed that I had autoimmune disease by making a series of significant lifestyle changes that I could do for myself Five years later, I had returned to relative health. The best part is that I am now 70, and I felt I feel better now than I did when I was 50. I no longer hurt, which is huge. I will always have autoimmune disease, but losing the pain has been amazing. I went back to school at 67 and became a health coach because I want to share everything that I learned with others. And I wrote a book called It Feels Good to Feel Good, learn to eliminate toxins, reduce inflammation, and feel great again, as the manual I wish that I had had when I got sick, and my book has won 13 awards. So whether you want to future-proof your health and grow old with dignity and grace without dementia and chronic pain and disease, which you don't need to get, or whether or not you already have a chronic condition, like autoimmune disease or cancer or heart disease, and you wanna learn about what things you can do to improve your long-term health, or whether you wanna improve the health of your families and raise healthy children, because 53% of our children have a chronic condition, I look forward to sharing all this information with you. I will tell you, it truly does feel good to feel good, so let's get started. I look forward to having you join me here every week And I want to give you hope that if you have chronic pain or chronic disease, you can make changes that will improve your health. And if you don't want to go there, you're going to be fine if you listen to the show and put these things into work. I want to give you information so that you can grow old and have a better tomorrow. So thank you for joining me. Let's get started. Hello, welcome to another edition of It Feels Good to Feel Good, Future Proof Your Health. And this is my second podcast on children. I am very passionate about this subject because as I explained in the last podcast, 54% of our children have a chronic illness and that is simply not acceptable. So we're gonna continue talking about children being addicted to sugar, feeding children processed food, how to feed kids for school, how to feed kids for lunch, just all kinds of tips on how to bring up healthier children because it takes a village to raise a child and we all need to participate in getting our children back on track because all these chemicals and all this sugar is impacting everything about the child from their brain to their moods to their learning ability. And so it's an important subject and I wanna continue with my thoughts on this and hopefully those of you who are parents out there will pay attention and will start to make adjustments so that you can raise healthier children, which is my ultimate goal. I'm past my child rearing years, but I do have grandchildren and I'm very passionate that this is an important subject for you all to pay attention to. Just to sort of reiterate where I left off last time, I talked about the fact that children are little pitchers, which means they need to learn from you. 
If you want to get them to detox off of the sugar and to stop eating all the chemicals and processed food, then I do run a quarterly kick sugar to the curb seminar. That's a four week seminar. And if you take it with me, by the time I'm done, you will have detoxed off of sugar. And if you put your family through it at the same time, they will have detoxed off the sugar. So it's a really important thing to do. These chemicals that are in processed and fast food are addictive and it only takes four weeks to get through the addiction. And when you come through the other end of the addiction, you turn back on your hunger hormones at the back of your neck, which means you know when you're full and you stop eating and they're no longer calling your name from the kitchen. And when you open up a pack of cookies, you only eat one. You don't eat the entire thing that, until it's gone, eating far beyond what you really want. And you know you don't want it, but you can't stop yourself from eating it. So if you do, um, write to me at my email address, which will flash on top of this, so that you can contact me and get information on the next Kick Sugar to the Curb seminar so that you can participate in that. The other thing that turning off these chemicals and sugar does is it refocuses all your feel-good hormones that you're supposed to naturally be producing. It will bring them back and so you're gonna feel good naturally without those chemicals. You don't need those chemicals to feel good. And what happens when you're eating those chemicals, you get a big shot of oxytocin, which makes you feel great, and then you crash. And so you wanna go back and you wanna get more because you wanna light up the same parts of your brains again. And the same thing is happening for children. The second thing I want you to pay attention to if you wanna get your children off of all the sugar and the chemicals is watch what they're seeing in terms of TV advertising. If it's in a TV ad, you don't want to buy it and you don't want to have it available for your child because there's plenty of money in there for them to advertise those foods because it's not high quality food and food quality matters. So make that a tip. If it's advertised on TV on all the kids' channels, you don't need it, you don't wanna buy it, you don't wanna be feeding it to your child. I'm convinced that the addictive chemicals in processed food, which includes fast food, processed frozen foods, and much of restaurant foods, which are now buying their food from big food and little baggies, zapping it and arranging it on your plate in the restaurant, making it look like something that they cooked, but probably isn't something that they cooked. All those chemicals are the reason that our children are so ill because they're not getting what they need. They're not getting the phytonutrients from real fruits and vegetables, and that's a problem. Addictions aren't easy, so to break up with these um, chemicals and with sugar, it really helps if you do it with other people, which is why I've started running quarterly detoxes, because to do it in a group, you got lots of support from the other people going through it at the same time, and I'm available to answer all your questions as you go through it. By detoxing off all these chemicals and sugar, when I got sick with autoimmune disease, without dieting, I have now lost 60 pounds. When my body was ready, it just dropped the weight because it didn't have any reason not to anymore. And my body wasn't holding on to absolutely every single phytonutrient that it was getting, which were not many because of all the junk I was eating. And so it finally came to a point where it all came into balance and dropped the weight. So if you wanna lose weight, it has nothing to do with power. If your child is obese and you want them to lose weight, it doesn't have to do with willpower. It has to do with addiction to these chemicals in processed food. And remember, the chemicals are the ones that you can't pronounce and you don't know what they are, even if it's something as simple as natural flavorings, which most likely is MSG, which is addictive. So real fruits and veggies are actually the magic fill, pill. Real food is medicine. You're not gonna to go to the doctor and get a magic pill. Real food is the magic pill that you need for your body. 
And the rainbow diet is even impossible to sustain until you get away from all those chemicals because your taste buds have been destroyed by those chemicals. So fruits and vegetables are not feeling good and tasting good. So just to change over to eating 75% real fruits and vegetables, you gotta get off the other crud, which is called crap because it's carbonated drinks, it's refined sugar, it's um, artificial ingredients, and it's processed ingredients. So get away from the crap, stop eating the standard American diet, and then you can start to eat real food. Diet foods and diet sugar are no better. They actually make you fat and they're making your child fat. And diet foods, diet pills, diet books are all feeding consumerism and are a billion dollar industry. And so obesity is big money and big food and big pharma and even big agriculture who's spraying all kinds of crud on our crops. They don't want you to win because they want to keep you hooked so that you keep coming back and buying more. These addictive things that they're putting into processed and fast food, they're doing it on purpose. They're perfectly aware that they're doing it because they want to keep you hooked because then you keep their industry healthy. And remember, they're not in it for your health. They're in it for their profits. So now I want to start talking about preconception before your child is even born. So if you're young and you're thinking about starting a family, this little section is going to be for you because it's important that you clean up your diet and your husband cleans up his diet before you even start to think about conceiving a child. So start at least a year out. Start cleaning all the other toxins out of your world, which is in your cleaning products and your water and your air. Start cleaning all of that up and start eating an organic diet that's loaded with fruits and vegetables before you even start to think about conception. Because children today are being born with as many as 287 toxins right in their umbilical cord that they're getting from both the mother and the father. I was surprised when I read that. I was surprised that the father had something to do with the 287 chemicals that are in that umbilical cord, but they are both impacting the health of that baby. So you both get to clean up and then you both have each other to support yourselves while you're cleaning up. So it's a good thing. Right from the start, an infant is starting with what's called a significant toxic load directly at the point of birth. So I want to talk about how that's impacting them right from the beginning. A developing child's chemical exposures, ex, a developing child's chemical exposures are greater pound for pound than those for adults because they're little tiny things and their systems can't handle it. An immature porous blood brain barrier allows higher chemical exposures to the developing brain. So it's impacting the infant's brain right at the point of birth, probably in the womb if he has that many chemicals in his umbilical cord. So it's really important because you want your child to have the best possible opportunities. So you want them to have a really great brain that learns easily and has great memory. And so it starts with you before birth. Children have lower levels of some chemical binding proteins, which allows the chemicals to reach their target organs. So right from the beginning, they're getting attacked by all these chemicals, which are impacting their health from the very start. Now, have you noticed how many children now have allergies much greater than they did at least, I'm 72, in my generation? I actually was born with a significant toxic load because I was born in Pittsburgh, and my joke was always that I popped out allergic to Pittsburgh Ends up that wasn't so far from true. My dad was a chemist, so he was smart enough to get me out of there at age four and a half, five, so that I could have a normal life. But by getting me out of Pittsburgh, my allergies calmed down and I was healthier. Um, 
and it ends up that I have something called MTHFR. So if you have a child loaded with allergies, you might want to get yourself checked, talk to your doctor about checking for MTHFR. I actually got that as part of my 23andMe test. And when my doctor, my functional doctor, knew I had taken that test, she went, oh, there's all kinds of backup materials from that and I want it. And the thing that she learned from that was I had inherited MTHFR as part of my genetic chemistry from both my mother and my father. And I wish I had known that while my parents were alive because they both died of diseases that were connected to MH, um, MTHFR. And what that means is that I was very low on folate, so I take a folate um, supplement now, and what goes in my body stays in my body. So I don't detox easily. I don't sweat easily. And so that might be a key if you have a child that's loaded with allergies and sensitivities. A baby's organs and systems are rapidly developing and thus they are more vulnerable to damage from chemical exposure. Systems that detoxify and excrete industrial chemicals are not fully developed yet. So if they're born with all these chemicals, they're going to impact their little bodies even more than when they're an older child. Although toxins are always negatively impacting children and adults, when they're that little, it's having even a more significant impact on their bodies. The longer future lifespan of a child is um, compared to an adult allows time for much more adverse, adverse effects to arise. So if they're starting off life with a heavy toxic load right from the beginning, it's gonna have a much greater impact as they grow older. And as I explained um, what in my tape about health and autoimmune disease, my podcast about that, toxic load was when I toppled over the top and I woke up one morning in extreme pain and it took a lot of research for me to figure out because my doctor didn't figure out that I had autoimmune disease because my toxic load had toppled over the top. So you don't want a baby starting out with a significant toxic load because they are gonna topple into chronic illness much more quickly than if they are not born with a significant toxic load right from the beginning. I've been listening to a symposium on the liver which is our detox organ. Everything goes through the liver and the liver tries to gather up all the toxins and then pick a pathway to get them out of the body. And if the body cannot detox all those chemicals out of the body because of toxic overload, then it begins to pr protect, I'll put that in quotes, the body by tucking those chemicals and poisons away in the body's fat and proteins. These chemicals hide until they begin to leak out later, making the body's organs increasingly unhealthy later in life. And so it's crucial that you eliminate the toxins before you feed them to your child, no matter what their age is. So give them a chance from the beginning, let them be born without all this chemical exposure. And then right from the beginning, start feeding them mother's milk, which again is impacted by what you're eating. So eating an organic diet is important for you to give your child a healthy start. And then we're gonna talk about what to feed the child as he begins to grow older because there's some disturbing new studies out about baby and toddler food, which I wanna talk about. So if you're planning to have a family, clean up your own toxic load now and then you, sh you should obviously be eating organic because you don't need glyphosate and all the other nasty herbicides and pesticides they're spraying on our food. And start to avoid GMOs, which if you listen to my podcast about what those are, they either have BT toxin grown right in them, which is blowing up the insect's little bodies, and then it gets into your gut. And it's the gift that keeps on giving. It's replicating in your gut, creating all your good minerals out of your body and creating havoc in your own health. So you don't want to be doing any of that. So make sure that you're eating an organic diet so that you have as little toxic load coming in from your food as possible. 
If you want to know what the GMOs are or you want to know what's the dirtiest of the vegetables, I have a card for both on my website, which is CherylMHillFuse.com. It is loaded with great information on my website, so go there and mosey around because you'll learn a lot that will help you eat a healthy diet and live a healthy life. And remember, this is as important for the father as it is for the mother especially before conception and then you both should be eating healthy food because that's also remember kids are little pitchers so as they grow up they're going to mimic what the two of you do you need to be eating real live organic food and eliminating anything from your diet that you can't pronounce or don't know what it is the old adage that you are what you eat is true and so what you want to be is beautiful lush vibrant colors that are creating health in your body and not fake crap that is in your standard American diet if you're eating fast and processed food. The diet, um, the comment about a father's diet is from a new study which even surprised researchers. And what they discovered was that folate deficient diets and male rats in the study made their children more likely to have birth defects and altered genes associated with the chronic diseases like diabetes, obesity, and cancer. How can this be? The father's diet had an impact on how his genes impacted his sperm. We're learning all of this through the study of epigenetics, which is still in itself in its infancy, but it's known that diet and lifestyle do impact the tendencies that we inherit in our genes and how they are expressed. So it makes sense that this is essential information both for the soon-to-be mother and the soon-to-be father before conception. I have talked in previous podcasts about, yes, we're given a certain DNA, but you have the ability to turn that DNA on or turn that DNA off. Habits tend to run in families. So that's the reason families seem to share a genetic code that becomes a disease. They get the genetic code, but they're turning those genes on to get cancer or to get heart disease or to get a fatty liver. It's not because it's just it's not only because it's in their genetics, it's because they are not eating so that food is medicine, so that those things get turned on. So remember, you have more power over this than you might imagine. It is known that diet and lifestyle do impact how the tendencies we inherit and our genes are expressed. So it makes sense that this is essential information for both the soon-to-be mother and the soon-to-be father. So do yourself a favor and do your child a favor and give them a clean slate of health right from the beginning and give it an optimal chance for good health to develop its body, mind, and natural intelligence by living and eating low toxin. I just listened to a podcast with Dr. Michael Skinner, who is a medical doctor up at Berkeley, and Jeffrey Smith, who is the head of the Institute for Responsible Technology. And he's been the person who's been campaigning against the dire impact of all this genetically modified foods on our bodies and our health. No one had ever studied the multi-generational impact of glyphosate before. And Dr. Skinner is part of a group at Berkeley that just finished a multi-year study on all of this and what they've found so far is worth noting there is an impact of roundup on the first generation there is no doubt about that roundup is glyphosate and they're the ones who last year lost a major multi-million dollar lawsuit for a guy who'd been spraying glyphosate on schoolyards and got lymphoma and yeah it does impact the first generation but this is where the study got frightening. There was even more of an impact on the second generation, and the impact on the third generation is absolutely horrific. So even if they don't have the glyphosate in their lives after the first generation, 
it is still starting to impact the second and the third generation. So your great grandchildren, if you have had a lot of impact from glyphosate or your child has had a lot of glyphosate in their world, your great grandchildren are the ones who are gonna get the horrific brunt of all of this. That means what you eat before you conceive that child impacts your great grandchildren even more than it's affecting your infant. Now think about that for a second. Many of the moms in the third generation actually died in childbirth in the third generation and the impact on the sexual organs and the kidneys of third generation children was huge amounts of disease and infertility. Now these were animal studies, but 90% of the third generation had disease issues. I don't know about you, but I find that pretty frightening. There's a lot of conversation now that we're, imp um, we're already impacting the reproductive abilities of our little girls and our little boys. Our little girls are maturing as early as eight now, and sperm counts are down in our little eight-year-old boys. So we need to pay attention to how all these chemicals are impacting our children, because it means that our race is gonna disappear no matter what we do with climate change, which is an important issue. But what we're feeding our children and all the glyphosate and the chemicals that are in our worlds are having just as big an impact as what we're doing for the climate. So think about this, because if we wanna survive and you want your great-grandchildren to survive, what decisions you make today will impact them. So. The bottom line of all of this that Dr. Skinner said is we have not even begun to understand the damage that eating all the glyphosate and all of these chemicals is having on the human race. And understand it's still being sprayed on our food, but you have the ability to choose not to buy foods that have been sprayed, which have been conventionally farmed. So take that responsibility seriously. I looked it up today because I know that there has been a lot of lawsuits against Monsanto slash Bayer because Bayer bought Monsanto right before the big settlement um, from the first guy that sued Monsanto for the glyphosate. And the reason that that guy won all of that money was because Monsanto had to cough up that they'd known for 20 years in their research that this was happening with glyphosate and its impact on our population. Bayer has now paid out on 47,000 settled lawsuits, but there are still 78,000 cases pending. But in spite of all of that, they're still spraying glyphosate on our food. So what can you do about it? Don't buy it. Make a concerted effort to buy organic and make sure that's a priority. You say you can't afford that? Frankly, you can't afford not to. So take a look at your budget, figure out where you can take money out of what you're spending in your budget and put it towards your food because food quality matters. It matters to your health and it really matters to your children's health and it matters to your grandchildren's health and your great-grandchildren's health. So yes, you have the money because if you don't spend the money now, you're going to spend it later on illness. So it's that important. And if you buy my second book, I have a whole section in my second book on 30 ways to save on healthy food. So go there, start there. Find ways to save on healthy food because it's important. And the $20 to buy my second book on how to not eat the standard American diet is well worth all the tips you're going to get to how not to go this direction. As a responsible parent, it's increasingly clear that becoming low toxin before conception and then in the long term of the health of your child is a critical factor to how your child will grow up and how much illness your child will deal with. Now, I know that moms try to make great choices for their children, so do your research and make informed decisions and don't stress over the decisions that you've made in your past because you didn't know any of this then. So just adopt healthier habits now. The next step, of course, is what do you do once you wean your child off your breast milk? And again, baby foods, there's a new study that just came out 
that baby foods are not only loaded with synthetic ingredients and chemicals that are not optimally healthy for your child, but at about seven to eight months old, you've been giving them baby and toddler food. And there's a new study out that now has indicated that they are loaded with heavy toxic metals, which impact every organ in your child's body and cause extra havoc on your child's liver. And remember I talked about the fact that kids now have a fatty liver, which was never seen in my generation or the generations that came right after me. So, and it's all of them. It's Gerber and Beech Nut and Hain. And those heavy toxic medical, um, Metals are simply unacceptable. So, what do you do about that? There's a couple kitchen machines that you can be to pulverize organic real food from the entire rainbow to feed to your infant and toddler. There's even cookbooks that will teach you what to put into these. There's a baby bullet, or I use what I call my mini chop, which is a little tiny Cuisinart that would pulverize food just beautifully, but you need to be buying real whole organic food and that's what you need to be making to feed your toddler and your infant because they don't need all those chemicals and they sure as heck don't need all that heavy toxic metal. So do your research. The way you're feeding your child will impact all the building blocks that your child needs to build new and healthy cells and they're going through their growing years. So you wanna make sure that every cell in your child's body is nourished with real phytonutrients and you control that. So start doing that today. One of the blogs that I quoted in the last podcast is Nourishing the Next Generation by Beetroot Mom. And she gives a step-by-step -step guideline on how to get your child to eat real food as the food her baby could eat progressed. I strongly recommend that you look up her blog because she's got great tips. And other moms that I've talked to have also introduced foods in a similar progression. In the beginning, you pulverize the food so it's the consistency of jarred baby food. All mothers have emphasized that you should offer new foods every meal in very small quantities, along with foods that you know your child likes and will eat. And you put them just little dabs of them on the plate and then you let your child decide what it does and doesn't want to eat. You make all the choices healthy choices, but then you let the child decide what they want to eat from there. You do not insist that the child eats any particular food. You just put them on the plate and you let them choose what they want to eat. They'll taste different things, they'll eat different things, and what they'll eat will progress as they progress. Each day you continue to offer the food until one day it gets eaten and then you introduce another new food. Beetroot Brook also offers multiple se selections in small quantities and the child gets to choose what they want to eat and all the choices are nutritious. People ask me all the time if my husband and I are deprived because we don't eat the American Standard Diet and frankly, I don't miss it and I don't want it and I can't, I don't even like the taste of it anymore. But we've talked about it and frankly, we were deprived before we ate that food. So if you bring up your children eating real food, they'll never know that they're deprived and they will grow up learning to love real food with real phytonutrients. And that will give your children's bodies what they need to be healthy. I've also learned that children respond positively to food if you make it fun. Bright colors, fun patterns made with nutritious food promote healthy eating. I'm going to put pictures right over this while I'm talking when my husband produces this podcast of silicon bowls that are in all kinds of fun shapes. They come in duckies and bears and elephants and silicon is, is a very healthy material for your um, child to be eating from. Plastic is not. Plastic leaches chemicals, silicon does not. So you then you wanna be creative with how you lay food out on the dish. So Google fun food for children on Pinterest and all kinds of boards will come up with great ideas to make food fun. And you're gonna be looking at some pictures as I'm talking of some fun things that you can do with food to make it more fun for your child to eat it. 
I have also found some superfood powders in intense colors that I use to make inventive recipes. I love color. I have always loved color. And I love these superfoods. And they come from Australia and they're called unicorn superfoods. So right now you're looking at some things that have been made with unicorn superfoods. They come in intense colors so you can make all kinds of fun things for your child. And the more colorful, the more fun it is and more appealing it is for your child to eat it. And we'll actually put a slide up with the um, link so that you can go right to it um, on your computer. And they deliver actually pretty quickly and they taste good. They're all real, they're all organic, and they are intense colors, which will make fun things. I even put them in my pancakes, which I make almond pancakes that are healthy pancakes, but I love making them in all the bright colors. Since I'm always talking about eating in the rainbow, I have fallen in love with these superfoods, and I'm actually planning a cookbook with a focus on eating rainbow recipes because each color has unique gifts and these superfoods each have unique gifts for the body. So you wanna raise your child with the ability to make choices. You wanna control what the choices are and that they're all good for them. And then you only wanna keep healthy options in the home. This will not change as the child progresses through different food cycles and eats differently but always make it real food with real phytonutrients. Feed the child what you, the adult, is eating as they grow older. Vary variety and color and shape and texture on your child's plate, and then when your child is growing, they will begin to mimic you. Multiple moms I've talked to have suggested teaching the child to read labels at a very early age, as early as possible. Again, children are little pitchers, so if they see you reading labels when you go to the grocery store and you're taking them with you, they're gonna wanna mimic you. Even before they're gonna, they can really read, they're gonna wanna mimic you. More than one ha mom has expressed that she's in the store reading labels, her child is mimicking reading labels even before they can read. They pick up the can or the box and they let their little fingers slide along the ingredients in the package. And once they do learn to read, they learn what good ingredients are and what harmful ingredients are. And these children are instilled with good eating habits from the very beginning. And these children are more difficult to sway once the child is finally on their own and off to school. One mom shared with me that her when her child was offered an unknown fo food, the child brought it home to discuss with her whether or not they should have eaten it or not. And, and um, so they had a whole conversation about it. Now, this child was not perfect because after they did that, they were offered Pop-Tarts and they did eat the Pop, the pop Rocks at a birthday party and they did eat them. But in general, they are very proud of making good food choices when they're away from home. If the child eats something off the program when they go out with other children, don't go getting twisty. It's all about toxic load, remember that. So the fact that they ate it once is not a big deal, but hopefully the child feels comfortable enough to come home and tell you what they did, and then you can have an honest conversation with the child about why they should or shouldn't have done that, and what healthier options might have been for them. One mother also shared that a year ago, her mother was not as concerned about um, serving healthy food as she was, so when they went off to grandma's house, Grandma was feeding them processed food. And her three-year-old actually looked at her mother and said, Grandma, we don't eat that. Wow. Now a year later, they've influenced Grandma. So not only are there much more healthy choices being offered, but Mom is now cognizant of what the children want to eat and should eat for their health. So it can happen. Make sure that only healthy choices are offered. It can be done. And it doesn't mean that the food is not delicious while it's also nutritious. Limit sugar and refined carbohydrates in your child's diet so that they aren't eating addictive things. And remember, children are eating 
34 teaspoons of sugar a day as kids if they're eating processed foods. So if you're, filling, if you're feeding them real food, then they're loving the sweetness from fruits and some of the vegetables like sweet potatoes. So they're not gonna be that inclined to go after the nasty foods that are processed. Teach your children why you're feeding them the food they're eating them, eating. Encourage them to ask questions about their food, where their food comes from and how it gets on the table for them to eat. Encourage them to ask questions. Take them with you to the farmer's market, but don't dictate what the, as they get out into the world, teach them the advantages of eating real food and then allow them to follow your example. As your child grows older, you want them to make their own decisions. You don't want them to feel deprived. And the more they understand why you're feeding them the way you are, the more they're gonna choose to eat that way as well. So bring up your child to be the leader of the pack that eats healthy food and bring them up to be little superheroes. I actually have a cartoon that I call my super veggie rangers. Teach them to be super veggie rangers and make them the influencer and not the follower when they're out with their friends. Encourage your child to cook with you. Partner with them to make their lunch plans and let them have some decision in what they're packing in their lunch box. I have a section in my book, Feeling Good, Living Low Toxin, all about raising healthy children. And there's even a chapter in there on the beauty of gardening with your child, which I wanna discuss in the third podcast that I'm gonna do on children. But make them a part of eating healthy food. Always make it fun and set a joyful expectation of eating real food. Dr. Hyman, who is the leading doctor in the functional medicine community, just posted something that I wanna read verbatim from him because it's important. This is Dr. Hyman. When we think about fixing the problem, it makes sense to also look at our schools. In Boston, for example, 30,000 children a day are relying on the school food system for two to three meals a day. That gives the educational system a whole lot of power to change the nutritional profile of our children's diets with real food. But unfortunately, many districts are stuck on relying on packaged and processed options. Michelle Obama had actually made some progress in this direction. And when Obama went out and Trump came in, I actually heard a GOP senator say, I talked to kids and they didn't want to eat that healthy food. They want to eat the junk. Well, I don't care what the child wants to eat. If you're a responsible senator, you don't want them eating that stuff because they're going to grow up addicted and sick. You want them to grow up healthy. So you want to work with the school system to have the healthiest options available as possible. Some groups are making amazing positive changes by installing real school kitchens that are serving real food with, made with real fruits and vegetables. So be an advocate. Get into your school system and talk to them about doing this. Get together with other parents and encourage your school systems to do this. A few simple ways to make school nutrition programs healthier are support schools as safe zones where access is only to foods that promote health and optimal brain functioning. Support changes in zoning laws. Prevent fast food and junk food outlets from operating next to schools. Build school gardens. Teach children about the origins of food and let them experience the sensory delight of real gardened fresh fruits and vegetables. Jamie Oliver could not get one child in a classroom in West Virginia to identify one vegetable. For God's sakes, that's a national crisis. And by the way, even if your school won't do this, start a small garden with your child. We're gonna talk about that in the next podcast. Bring back basic cooking skills to schools as part of the curriculum, including essential life tools. Now, when I was in school, eight million years ago, I actually went through something called home ec. And we learned to cook and we learned to sew in that course. 
Those courses are no longer available in most schools, but they're important. So get together with parents and talk to your school districts about the fact you would like your children to learn to cook in school and then make sure that you are cooking with your child at home. Make sure that the options that they get, now I've moved away from Dr. Hyman, this is me again. Make sure that the options that your children get to eat at home are nutritious, wholesome, and easy to grab. Keep vegetables cut up in the refrigerator for snacking. Keep a variety of fun dips available for the child to dip the vegetables into. We actually make take almond sour cream, so it's not dairy. I mean, you don't have to worry about whether it's full fat or the cruddy little low fat stuff. It's almond sour cream, and it becomes very yummy with simply organic, either ranch or onion soup mix. Primal Palette also makes great spice mi mixes for dips. John and I were two like, like two little kids when we made our first dip this way, because we got to eat vegetables that we were putting into our own dips that were as yummy as the ones we remembered when we were younger. It was fantastic and it tasted like the old dips, but it's way healthier. So you wanna make these for your kids. And I have been told that dips are big with kids. So keep a variety of different hummuses, nut butters. I make my own um, nut things out of soaked cashew nuts and then I add my own seasonings so that they're yummy on vegetables. But make sure you have a whole bunch of different wholesome and healthy options available and make your own. It is not difficult and so much healthier. So when you get online, look for paleo or vegan dip recipes because they will tend to be much more healthy. Variety is important. Make homemade vegetable chips from a variety of different vegetables, which means you slice them thin and then toss them in ghee and seasonings and crisp them on low in the oven. I started, I, I um, use several of our favorite seasonings and then I crisp them and we'll even eat those sometimes for our own snacks in the afternoon. You can also buy shapes like stars and hearts to cut your vegetables for serving. Again, the more fun you make the shapes and the more fun you make it, the more likely your child is going to eat it. If you own a dehydrator, then use it to make crispy, real vegetable snacks. Aim for a good protein and fats, which are omega-3 fats, remember, and I have a card for that on my website. Make sure that you include a good protein and fats in the snacks you keep on hand. Save fruit for dessert for dinner. Other healthy snack ideas for children and for adults. Plantain or sweet potato chips with guacamole. Make your own chips, it's easy. And if you have the right mandolin or slicer, you can get them really thin. But if you do buy store-bought, make sure they were made in a healthy oil and that they're organic. Make your own guacamole, it's easy. I make mine the fast way. I smash up the avocado with fresh tomato salsa, mild, from Whole Foods. It seems to be a Whole Foods almost everywhere in the country. And then I add garlic and onion powder and lemon juice. And it makes a delicious guacamole. And there's just enough heat in the mild salsa, so it makes a great guacamole. All good. I'm a spice whisk, so that's important to me. Trail mix. I save jars. And since we use ghee instead of butter, I use the ghee jars for a variety of purposes. Trail mix is easy to make up in your oven and keep on hand to grab and go. So what do I put in my trail mix? Almonds, pecans, cashews, large coconut flakes, organic raisins, dried cherries, pumpkin seeds, um, sunflower seeds, and some of the items that I add, I actually will soak before I dehydrate them or I purchase them already sprouted as organic nuts. I use Enjoy Life chocolate chips because they're soy free and they're delicious by the way, and they're 70%, so they're also high, so they're good because they won't impact the sugar. I also recently found soy free white chocolate morsels from Pasha made with rice milk they're a good choice. And I throw that all into my granola mix with organic oats. 
I spread it out on parchment paper, and then I bake it until it becomes dried. And the ghee with a little bit of honey mixed in makes it just sweet enough, because sugar is sugar is sugar, but it makes it just sweet enough that you now have a healthy treat, which is trail mix or homemade granola. You can make your own homemade crackers. I have a blog for um, appetizers at the holiday time where I actually share some of my cracker recipes. So you can make healthy crackers without any of the ingredients you can't pronounce that are good for your kids. Pitted olives are a good choice for snacking. Hard boiled eggs, we buy Vital Farm eggs because those chickens are healthy. They run around in the field and are organic. They're portable, they're feeling, filling, they're versatile. Cucumbers, snap peas, carrot sticks, celery, jicama with homemade ranch dressing. And I use Danielle Walker's recipe, which is non-dairy. And it tastes pretty much like real ranch dressing, but it's made with follow your heart, soy free mayo and coconut cream. Not a huge fan on coconut, but I love this dressing. And then I put real deal real dill, real garlic, uh, and some real shallots into it. It's yummy. Lately, we're also using primal, primal kitchen salad dressings, all of which are yummy to dip vegetables in. Tortilla chips with guac or salsa. I prefer Honest Jackson's organic tortilla chips, but remember you don't wanna be eating huge amounts of those because that's a, a um, becomes a simple carb and you only want to eat organic corn chips because corn is a genetically modified crop. Popcorn, buy organic or pop your own. There are also many store-bought popcorns available that are organic. We enjoy Quinn popcorn. We also like Lesser Evil and Bootable popcorns with sea salt and make sure you're buying them either in ghee or avocado oil because then they're in a good omega-3 oil so they're good all the way around. Again, not in huge quantities because it's a simple carbohydrate, but only organic and only done in omega-3 oils. We buy this kind of snack from Thrive Market, which is an online market that's a membership, but you save a lot of money. You pay, I think it's $55 now for the year, and then you save up to 25, sometimes 40% on everything you buy. So I buy that kind of thing from Thrive Market. They deliver, so I don't have to be going running around the grocery store looking for them. They just come to the house and then I put them in my pantry and they're ready to go. Pretzels. We also enjoy Quinn pretzels because they're organic and we like Newman's organic pretzel sticks, which have become a little harder to get, but they're great and they taste great. Lara bars for an occasional on-the-go treat, but watch the sugar amounts because they vary dramatically by bar. And Ojoy Life now has protein chocolate balls and rice make crunchy chocolate bars, which are also a great occasional treat. And they make yummy seed and nut bars. I do bake on occasion, so you can also bake for your children. And one of the things I make is Danielle Walker, who's a paleo, cookbook writer, her real deal chocolate chip cookies, which are made with almond flour and coconut sugar. They're delicious. And you can Google and it, the recipe will come right up. And so now let's talk about what you're going to do for lunch for your child. For the first years of the child's life, you're controlling his options. And as soon as he's old enough to leave the house, it's going to get a little more complicated. So I know some moms are concerned that their children are gonna eat unhealthy snacks and foods that the other children have with them. I follow a mom on Facebook that's doing an outstanding job at communicating what ingredients are healthy and what ingredients should be avoided. She's gotten very famous going after big food for toxic ingredients and her name is Food Babe. She has gone after companies to get all these toxic ingredients out of processed food I frankly would rather have you just avoid the processed food. And I commented once on her post on Facebook that I would prefer that they not go to those foods at all. Why was she spending so much time cleaning up processed food? And it's because she believes that when her child gets to school, they're gonna be given options. So she wants those options to even be as clean as possible from big food as possible. And that certainly is a valid concern and a worthy approach. but. In dealing with the big picture, it's not specifically what her child will confront and then choose. I've discovered 
from the moms that I've talked with that a child can be prepared to deal with this and make healthy choices. So you can work with your child and have them come home and talk to you if they're making bad choices so that you can continue to be the example for them and so that they will follow you and keep at least the junk that they're eating down to a limited amount. Ann Lander said, it's not what you do for your children, but what you have taught them to do for themselves that makes the, them successful human beings. So keep talking to your child, keep being the example so that they keep following your example as they go through life. A couple of other thoughts about school lunches, no plastic, not on their plate, not their juice or water bottle, not their sandwich bag. Use bamboo utensils, Plastic leach is poison, so you don't want them using that. And buy them stainless steel water bottles to carry to school and buy them stainless steel lunch boxes. And we'll put something up here that will take you to Planet Box, who makes beautiful lunch boxes made out of stainless steel. You can buy stainless steel containers for hot chocolate and hot soup but make your own hot chocolate with alternative milk and real organic cocoa. Cocoa is another dirty crop, so if you're going to be giving their, your children hot chocolate, make your own because they'll be better off for it. And then sweeten with maple syrup, coconut syrup, or honey because there are trace elements in those that are better for your child. And don't use as much sweet as would be in the product if you were buying it pre-made. Concentrate on a high quality protein and a good fat in their lunches. And if you need a refresher on this, my first book, It Feels Good to Feel Good, Learn to Eliminate Toxins, Reduce Inflammation, and Feel Great Again, has chapters on what all this means. A good healthy lunch should be balanced. So include a protein, either Applegate organic lunch meats, or if you can't find organic natural lunch meats, they're still healthier than other forms of lunch meats, pasteurized pastured chicken, leftover grass-fed beef from the night before, pastured turkey. We're pretty much being able to buy turkey all year round now because I'm sensitive to chicken. So we buy turkey regularly and I use it instead of chicken. I miss chicken, but I'm eating more turkey. And then I make the carcasses into turkey soup and it's yummy. Veggies. Your lunches should all include organic in all the colors in small pieces, easy to pick up and eat, and include each in each lunchbox three colors in the assortment. You can include a healthy dip for the vegetables in the lunchbox. You can include fruit cut up in small pieces. Make protein or fruit kebabs. Consider wooden skewers and break off the sharp points so that the child doesn't hurt himself and then use all the different colors of veggies and fruit. This makes them fun so that the child will enjoy getting these in his box. And I bet other little kids are gonna want them too. Include some kind of a carb, but make it organic, whether it's popcorn or a small amount of potato chips or a small amount of pretzels. Include a carb and make it fun. Don't make it so that your child never gets that stuff, just make it the healthiest version of that stuff. Mix up shapes and colors. Use the small cookie cutters that I talked about earlier in heart shapes, star shapes, and butterflies, and flowers. Use them to cut your vegetables into fun shapes. Use all the colors of the rainbow. The benefit of taking your lunchbox and sending it off to, with the child, and the child's going to build what goes into those lunchboxes with you, is you are again controlling the nutrients that your child is going to eat because you're avoiding processed foods and eating high nutrient food will improve their learning. Sweets are not everyday treats, but that does not mean that you should eliminate them completely. I also make Danielle Walker's shortbread cookie um, recipe, and sometimes I even dip one half of them into melted um, chocolate chips, and it's yummy, as long as you make sure you are not buying chocolate chips with soy. The important thing is always feed your child for its nutrition because the body wants to be healthy, so you want to give it the right building blocks. And that's super important for your child to choose foods for their nutritional value and teach your child to love them. 
Also, buy bone broth. I buy Kettle and Fire because I keep, keep it on the shelf in my pantry. And I also buy frozen bone broth, which has a little bit more flavor. And then I can make instant soups for the child. No more Campbell's soup for my grandchildren. Make real, yeah, just steam some vegetables and add some bone broth in your Vitamix or your blender and add some of your own seasonings and add sea salt so that they're not getting all those nasty things you can't pronounce in their soup and you're giving them a nutritious soup when they're home for lunch. Remember, if the animal's eaten a lot of chemicals, the chemicals lodge into their bones and bone broth will pull it out. So you want to be making your own bone broth if you're making it from grass-fed um, and pastured chicken and beef so that it's healthy for your family and it's not hard to meet. Turkey broth is the easiest. Chicken broth is also easy if he's a healthy chicken. And then you can make all your own soups. I also add ghee into my soup because that's a healthy fat and it adds a depth of flavor. Dinners should be eaten always around the dinner table whenever possible as a family. Not only is this a great opportunity to be a great example for your children with good eating habits, but it's a wonderful time to bond. It's a wonderful time to find out what your child is doing when they're not at home. And we did that as a family, and those are some of my best memories of my childhood. We used to tell funny stories on ourselves around the dinner table. My parents told funny stories on themselves. My brother and I told funny stories on ourselves. We shared our wins and our defeats, and we got advice about how to regroup when it was necessary. I have very loving memories of doing this. And so we ate almost always at the same time at night, and my father always tried to be home for dinner time by clean meat, which means the animal should be eating what is specific to his diet. We've talked about that. And I will admit those meats are more expensive. So feed your family smaller amounts of them, but make sure that food quality matters. And then if you're eating clean meat, they don't have all the hormones and the stress hormones and the other things that are in the conventionally produced meat. Remember that food quality matters at every meal, and keep in mind that even depression starts in the gut. A happy gut is a happy mindset for your child. Last comment, there are so many allergies and sensitivities now that as a parent, you need to observe what happens to a child's body as you introduce new things into their environment and into their food. This includes food, fabrics, medicines, pets, etc. For an explanation of the difference between sensitivities and allergies, it's in my first book, It Feels Good to Feel Good, Learn to Eliminate Toxins, Reduce Inflammation, and Feel Great Again. And so I really recommend that you buy my two books because they are loaded with great information and I read them so that you don't have to do the five years of research that I did. And they're written for laymen because I'm a layman. So that's everything that I learned to make my life tolerable after I got autoimmune disease and to ditch the pain. And so take advantage of all the information. You can read my books in any order for whatever it is you need at the moment and they're loaded with great information. It's important to remember that when given healthy foods, ten, children will tend to gravitate to what they need at the time. So ask them to make their own choice and re I want to reinforce that all of those choices should be hung. All right, my hour is up, but I want to make one last comment. What your child drinks is as important as what your child eats. Coke, Pepsi, Pop, whether it's diet or it's real, it's gut rock. So don't let your children be drinking all of that stuff. I have a friend who is so addicted to Diet Coke, he would rather chew his arm off than give it up. A real Coke has 39 grams of sugar in it, which is 10 teaspoons. But even fruit juices are loaded with sugar. Um, I picked up a bottle of organic old orchard berry and it has 11.5 teaspoons of sugar in it. So teach your children to drink water. Infuse berries in the water so that they get the delightful taste of the berries. 
but don't let them drink pop. It's just got awful for them. And if you don't allow them to have it at home, then they probably are not gonna like it when they do drink it away from the home. And that's important. So next podcast, I'm gonna talk about growing simple vegetables with your child, the importance of getting your child out into nature, and the importance of reading with your child starting even before they're born. So thank you. Your child's health is critical to what kind of an adult they're going to grow up and how productive they're going to be as an adult. So don't let your child be one of the 54% that has a chronic illness. You control that. You have much more power over the health of your child than you might realize. So adopt all of these suggestions and raise healthy children. Your child will be happier, your child will be healthier, and you will be a happier and healthier family as a result. Thank you for joining me. I love sharing all this information with you, and I'll see you again soon. Hello. Could I see a show of hands if there's anybody out there like me who's tried to lose weight their whole life and not been successful? So you've tried all the different diets available. You've tried Weight Watcher. You've tried Jenny Craig. You've tried all the New York Times bestsellers. And the last time you did it, you started off great, just like all the other times. And you started losing weight. And then all of a sudden, you fell off the horse. And before you know it, you're eating fast food and processed food again with all that sugar. And you don't even know why. And in the end, you've gained more weight than where you started out. So you now are beating yourself up that you just don't have the willpower to win. If that's you, I want to address the elephant in the room because nine years ago I got autoimmune disease and started researching because I didn't want the pain that came with the autoimmune disease and the added benefit was I lost the weight along the way. So let me tell you what happens. Big food doesn't want you to win. They've rigged the system. They put so many chemicals into fast food and processed food that they light up the brain like a pinball machine. It's the same part of the brain that goes off for cocaine and heroin. And you feel great when you eat that food, but it's not making you feel good. And you're starving your body for nutrition because it's loaded with empty calories. So you're getting fat eating that food and it's not giving your body what you need. And it's turning off all your own feel good hormones of serotonin and dopamine and even your insulin which keeps your moods even but worse than that there's two little hormones here at the back of your neck called ghrelin and leptin and they don't work and they regulate your appetite because all those chemicals have subdued them so you don't even know when you're full so what did i learn to do instead i'm eating the glad diet loaded with all the phytonutrients that my body needs to be healthy and to thrive and to boost my immune system and to ditch the pain and along the way of eating all this live food I've lost 60 pounds without dieting. You see, I was starving my body for nutrition when I was eating the standard American diet. And now that I'm giving my body all those beautiful phytonutrients, it's not holding on to it anymore. So it's just dropping it automatically. So don't eat the standard American diet. I don't want you to get a standard American disease. And I certainly don't want you to die the standard American death. Instead, start eating the GLAD diet because by eating all those beautiful phytonutrients, you will be healthier and you will live long and thrive. Thank you.